All right, everyone. Welcome to Mr. Gulp Podcast by the Fox Wolf YouTube channel. Hope you viewers enjoy this video. New environment, new place, new room. It's time to get down to business, guys. We'll talk anything about anything when it comes to professional boxing, when it comes to VTubers, when it comes to the world of greats. And the greatest of all time is the controversy of the World Light Heavyweight Championship with Artur Benavidev and Dimitri Bivol. Now, we can talk about this all day long if we want to, but if we would, it would last an hour, and that would be the end of the podcast. We could talk about anything. I could talk about whatever. But when it comes to Undisputed, you know you have to talk about it, man. You, you know you have to. And the only information I can tell you guys is, was there a robbery? Was there something behind bars? Technically, guys, when I watched the fight, I looked back at it. There were chances that... Each fighter had their own rights of winning. Like, yes, in the first three rounds, you had you had um, Arter Betterbee struggling at times. And even by round three, it seemed like Betterbee was coming back a little bit strong at times. But I thought Dimitri Bavol won that round. Uh, Bavol did have something in round eight and round nine and such. And he did squeak out those rounds. And But when you look at rounds like round five, round six, and even though round 10, 11, 12, and those were like rounds for Betterbee but yeah, you, and then you go right into the middle of the reality from round four to round seven. And then you look at those rounds closely and you have to think to yourself, who do you think won the fight? And even though I did think that round four was somewhat of a better be of round, round seven seemed close enough to be a bivol round. I thought the fight ended in 114 to 114, in my opinion. Even one judge named Oliver Palomo had the same way. Two others had it 115 to 113 for Glenn Feldman. He scored it fairly, and, and it seemed like it was good enough. It looked like probably he had what it took, so it seemed like a better BF win. But 116 to 112 of Paul Cardinan? Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't think 116 to 112 for better BF was that much of a round. It was close enough. You could say it was 115 to 113. For Bivol, hell, even a lot of people in professional officials think it was 116 to 112 for Bivol. So you can say whatever you want to, but it, it was an interesting fight nonetheless. By the way, what happened that day on October the 12th, one week during that moment? Well, guys, it's simple. Due to Bob Aaron Productions with Spencer Brown, Eddie Hearn, Benjamin Shalom, and Frank Warren were all in promoters that day with Steve Furness, the matchmaker, and involved with everyone else there with the Zone PPV. USA ESPN Plus. There was a lot of interesting things out there. Uh, Jay Opataya wins his 26th fight against Jack Massey to retain out his IBF World Cruiserweight title. Uh, Chris Eubank wins that ridiculous IBO World Middleweight Champion, which is still a minor weight organization against a nobody by round 7 KO. But yet again, Chris to this day has still not won a major belt. Uh, we don't know how long it's going to take. Uh, Sky Nicholson went on 10 rounds the decision to regain her WBC World Featherweight Champion. Uh, ben Whittaker became a bust after that lame fight. And ever since, they both had sustained injuries in both fighters. So it was a TD decision. Uh, two fighters made their debuts that day. And they won their first fights by decisions. Fabio Wardley and Fraser Clark. I can tell you guys, this was a ridiculous fight. Because like at this moment, guys... One guy is in his 20s, the other guy is in his mid-30s, and he owes, he's only had eight fights. And I was thinking that Fraser Clark, considering he's 33 years old, he's almost like the next Joe Joyce of boxing. A guy that's in his in over his 30s, and you think to yourself, oh, he's going to do something great. But the more older you get, the more ridiculous you think it is. It's ridiculous. And Fabio Wardley, considering how controversially dumb it is, Seeing the fight end by a draw in both of their careers, both British, it just made me think to myself, why put this fight on the line again? Surprisingly, I don't think anyone expected a first round TKO. And you know what? I don't want to expect a trilogy fight from this. Fabio Wardley, I don't think he has what it takes. But when you look at that for perspective, I can't say much about it other than luck. Yeah. Uh, also, guys, um, on October the 17th, considering BoxRec has not um, officially um, posted this yet, Muslim Gadzima Gomadov 
the WBA Bridgeweight title holder has defended his belt against Leon Hart after dominating a 12 round fight. It was pretty good enough for what it was by um, out for matchmaker of Oleg Bogdanovo. Uh, he also promoted out a uh, matchmaker, another fight from Russia Match TV, which was the TV at the time, with a couple other fighters in their career. So, um, yeah, good start for him. Um, <coughs> considering this guy has done a good job, um, but Muslim, I will say, though, might need more practice. Like, it's great that he went 12 rounds of decision against a guy that might not have much skills. Uh, he proved himself that he can go 12 rounds of distance. He can prove that he can do anything he wants to. So I am happy to see that. I'm happy for uh, anyone else. So it's, um, as for what it is, I really can't say much about it other than, like, um, like doing a good job and... Um, I'll just say keep practicing, practicing is all I can say, but for anything else, I wouldn't say much about it. And guys, even when I talk about VTubers, I don't talk about them as much, but I really did not realize this until right now. As 12 days ago, um, a video by YouTuber VTubers Daily released a video of Cinder has a sad announcement. And to be honest, the video was no more than just her just sobbing a little bit, and it seemed like something was up, and... Um, but mostly, having a party, this or that, she tows us all, and um, mostly, for everything else, we just heard that she's actually having out in a vacation, but for anything else, um, nothing much, because people in the comments are just saying, oh, it's just a vacation, and um, we just say good luck, because guys, everyone needs time off on the internet, so... Let's not all freak out. If we say goodbye, we say goodbye. And it is bad that there's some people out there that don't give us a final goodbye farewell. Like Outfox Gaming doesn't give us a chance that he say he might never come back again. Even Rose Doodle was another person that was former VR chat at the time, and she's been out of the spotlight for a long time. So it's weird that those other people back in the day have been in problems for a while. Heck, Chromia has uploaded a couple streams on her channel as her character of Chromia. So who knows? Who knows? So, technically, there's nothing much to say about that other than, like, yet again, are we ever going to see them again? It is what it is. Yeah. Um. By the way, guys, as uh, more reports are still on hold, um, for anyone else to, to remind you this, um, not saying much about this, guys, um, but we did hear reports that, as said, um, Don King has been having problems due to health and, um, considering ever since having some, uh, a little bit of some, uh, um, controversies lately, um, due to his, um, eccentric types and, um, other news reports, um, we haven't had much of everything to talk about other than talk about how, um, uh, considering due to his old age and he has been seems like that everything that's happening him is already getting a little bit closer by the minute because uh, we just heard that that after some days we've already heard reports about 28 days ago on daily mail stated that don king at 93 breaks silence after mike tyson claimed the legendary boxer pounder is not doing well right now because four weeks ago, um, mostly he's been having problems due to illness and such. And considering that he's in old age, um, we really can't say much about that. Considering all we know is uh, Tyson did said about the 93-year-old Don King saying that Don is not doing well right now. He's probably close to 100 years old. He's not doing well. Uh, it, yeah, m most at this moment, it's like... We don't know what's going to happen because at this moment, uh, we're already going past the Rumble in the Jungle anniversary. So is this like the end of a, a career? Yet again, Bob Arum is almost going away too because he's around 93 years old. It is surprising how these guys are living a long time and it's a crazy push. It really is. So it's so it is crazy to go to show you what crazy stuff is happening behind the scenes. So it is crazy. Uh, the final information I will say about this one uh, before we get to the bigger stuff. <sighs> Guys, 
Um, um, yeah, this one is going to be hilarious. So, guys, I don't like to repeat my stuff again, but I might as well. So, on December the 30th, 2018, a Thailand guy named Tasana Salapat takes on Takuma Inoue. Takuma Inoue was a 12 0 guy. Him and his brother, Naoya Inoue, pound for pound of all time, had been fought for the WBC Interim World Bantamweight title. Now, of course, Takuma won that fight by 12 rounds, and after that, he lost the fight, and so on. Uh, also, guys, speaking about the Bantamweight, uh, the Bantamweight division stated as him being the WBA Bantamweight champion. When I say that Japanese boxers are unstoppable stoppable in the Bantamweight, I did not expect it to go like this, as a guy named Seiya Tsutsumi would fight Takuma Inoue in October the 13th in Ariaka Arena in Kotoku, Japan. He goes 12 rounds of distance with uh, Takuma and his 12-0 and, and 2. He's the number 2 ranked fighter in the bantamweight winning the WBA. Wow, crazy or not. But guys, you want to know something more crazy about this? Um, Tasana, after his loss, he continued taking on nobody fights, bum, trash, garbage camp opponents. Uh, he did take on one guy that was 33 and 3 at one point in 2021, but yet again, nothing special about this. It, at this moment, it, it, he was just like, 30 years old. I'm just waiting for him to just get a fight. Just, just take a fight already. And finally, Junto Nakatani would give him the WBC World Bantamweight title shot, and he. Junto obliterated this guy in six rounds, finished him in the last second by TKO in a six round. Man. And you want to know what's crazy that night? Not only that Junto would win that fight better than how Takuma Inoue did, we even had some crazy other stuff happening. Like two um, 1 0 against 1 0 fighter and and four rounds ended in majority decision with two fighters going 38 to 38. Um, this another fight that went by the name of Tenshin um, Nasukawa has now been five and zero, defeating a uh, considering he's now number 37, ranked 37 in the bantamweight. He's five and zero, 26 years old. He defeated a guy named Gerwin Asilo from the Philippines. He was a 9-0 fighter. Now he's ranked number 75 in the world. They've gone 10 rounds of distance for the WBO Asia Pacific Bantamweight title. The last two fights are shocking. That's a guy named Anthony Auskuga from the USA. WBO World Flyweight title takes on Jonathan Gonzalez, Puerto Rican, born in New York, USA. The fight went only one minute two minutes and 25 seconds in the first round when it stated that Gonzalez injured the top of his left eye in an accidental headbutt. Fight was a no contest. And by the way, the promoter's name during this show was Akihiko Honda. So, um, pretty much that's about it, except one. WBO World Super Flyweight Champion Kose Tanaka. 20 wins, 1 loss, Fights against a guy named Pameli Kafu, a guy with 10 wins, 3 draws, and 8 knockouts. This guy's boxing career is so random. His first professional fight happened back in May of 2018. He wins a fight. His second fight against another debut fighter goes points by draw. He wins two other fights that year by knockouts. And then in 2019, his first fight <clears throat> against a fighter with six wins and six losses, he goes 10 rounds by, by decision in a draw. Three months later, he fights against a guy for the WBF International Flyweight title, goes four rounds by TKO. Then he wins another fight by, well, another fight ends by majority draw for the Boxing South um, Africa Flyweight title. Another draw. And that was a tough fighter he was fighting against. And yeah, it's... And just to let you viewers know, the fight after September 28, 2019, after he won that fight for the WBF title, 
That fight with the boxing South African title took place on March the 27th, 2022. He took a full several years off, which has to be because of the COVID. Like, at, at this moment, his record is four wins and three draws and four by knockout. And it didn't stop him from boxing hard again. He takes on then 7-0 guy, goes by five round and KO in May that year. And then in July 2022, he goes five rounds by Corman retirement. October, another knockout. He goes split decision by Jackson Chalky, the guy that went majority draw decision March that year. And he they, they have a rematch in December. He gets a win on him. And then 2023 is the moment where he finally built up something. But all these fights were from Africa, South Africa. <clears throat> so he fights a fight in August 20th. He wins a fight by 10 rounds of unanimous decision for the IBF International Super Flyweight title. Fair. And then he finally fights... The, he he boxes for the African American super flyweight title this time. Like the last fight he did was the flyweight title of South African. This time it's the super flyweight title of South African. He goes first round KO on December. <clears throat> and then 10 months later, he fights against Tanaka. And dude, he just brought in the fight of his life. 12 rounds, all three judges scored 114 to 113. Split decision. Kafu bring out the upset in Japan. And I wouldn't say it was a fluke because, like, because at the end of the day, like, like, like guys, obviously, Tanaka won round one. Kafu got round two and round three. Round four was Tanaka. Round five was a knockout, 10-8. Kafu knocked him down, so that was a win, which did affect the part of the points. Round six <clears throat> was a pretty, pretty hard round to judge. It, 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 was, it was a hard round, and round six was close enough as probably Kafu, and by round seven... It was Tanaka. Uh, round eight was Tanaka again, which was close enough to be him. Same with round nine, which was another close round. And well, I wouldn't say close. Tanaka was putting in good efforts in those later rounds. And round ten was another dominating round again for him again. And round eleven was Kafu all in. He brought in the work. And at this moment, after eleven rounds, the fight was over. Kafu won. Because even if Tanaka won the 12th and final round and all three judges gave it to him, the score would have been two judges giving him 114 to 113 and the other giving it 114 to 113 for Tanaka. So the fight was already over after round 11. He won the fight. There was nothing you would have done. And in round 12, Tanaka just put in the biggest round of his life and won. Um, <clears throat> so technically, my... It, it, considering Kafu did put in a good effort, he knocked down, like, it would have been almost six rounds of fight, probably five rounds in favor for um, the fight. Kafu won, like, five rounds, in my opinion, but the knockout did kind of affect it, so it would have been, like, if he didn't get that knockout in round five, the fight would have ended in a majority draw. It, it would have been six rounds, five rounds, who knows, but, yeah, I did thought Tanaka won that fight with six rounds to five with a point abduction loss for him without it within seven to five but still but <clears throat> yet again it was uh it, it was it was a, it was a good fight I, I gotta give credit it was a good close fight uh Kafu started the fight off pretty strong in the first six rounds and he did put in a good effort the Tanaka finished it off really strongly and but round 11 was the fatal round that gave Kafu the win so I really, really can't say that it was a good performance. It, it was a good fight. South Africa and Japan, he fought in Japan and won the title. 11 wins, 3 draws, 8 knockouts. 
Oh my god. It's ridiculous. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah, <clears throat> Could, technically, I would say it was pretty great for what it was. It was. I just think with most of the stuff that we know today, at the end of the day, guys, we're going to have controversial decisions, and, and, and that's the way boxing goes. We're human beings. We make mistakes. And I think that's the thing we have to learn. Like, at the end of the day, we're going to have a lot of controversial decisions. We might be upset that our wrong fighter won. And it is what it is. It, it really is. And I think that's something we have to learn. It, it's, <clears throat> it's tough. <sighs> so, um. There's nothing much I can say about it. Anyway, guys. Um, so while we're on the cusp here, guys, about Japanese boxers, let's get down to business. After trying to look up who the next opponent is, um, <clears throat> if you don't mind me saying this, uh, on BibleofBoxing.com, as uh, on Bing.com, by ringtv.com is what I meant to say originally. Um, the reports have stated on October the 15th stated that Naoya Inoue and Sam Goodman will be in for the IBF mandatory title fight heads off to October the 29th purse bid. Uh, reports stated mostly as for September the 12th, 2024, uh, IBF order championship Naoya Inoue for number one rated Sam Goodman to begin negotiations. Um, as for president for uh, Daryl People, um, the president, to inform all registered promoters in a letter obtained by the ring. An agreement could not be reached during the time frame allotted. Um, <clears throat> if they don't, if the IBF is ordering a purse bid in the office on Tuesday the 29th at 12 noon, bids must be submitted at 11.45 a.m. to be promptly open at 12 noon now there's other articles talking about the record the resumes this or that all we know is in a way 28 25 knockouts undefeated sam goodman australian 19 wins eight knockouts undefeated uh, and he's with no limit boxing to considering because um because as before because the rings of number two pound for pound entrant and reigning fighter of the year is also co-promoted by top rank um <clears throat> which is the information because at this moment uh we do have to think to ourselves what about the other fighters like what about a uh, merle john akmadaliev the guy that lost against marlon tapales for the wba and ibf last year ago that he also fought against in a way to become the super bantamweight undisputed champion that noya did that was a close fight, and, and Tapales barely won that fight. So, say what you want about it, but yeah, it's pretty interesting. But guys, here's something interesting. There's a lot of fans out there that are just throwing so much crazy stuff, saying that Noya Inoue should fight in the USA, oh, fighting in Japan, ah, and there's so many fans saying this horrible crap stuff about him, and... But guys, here's the thing. Like, guys, fighting in the USA doesn't mean anything about a, pipe, a fighter fighting out of the country. It's not like how Manuel Char lost his WBA in 2021 because of Don King's shenanigans and the visa problem and how he lost the belt because he never fought in America. Yes, it's important, but Trevor Bryan, well, he's never fought in Europe. He's fought in South American before and other places, but like Venezuela... But no, that is the problem when you're a champion and you have to keep the title. But for Naoya, in a way, yes, he's undisputed. He's the king. 
He's from Japan, and he can fight if he wants to be there. Like, you don't have to tell someone to fight in Japan for a reason. If he doesn't, then he doesn't. Like, guys, Jesse Rodriguez has only fought in Mexico during the start of his 2017 career in his professional. And after that, 2018, he started fighting full-time in the U.S. and has been there since. He, well, he did fought once in 2017 during his early years. But, yeah, Jesse Rodriguez is number one super flyweight, and he's fought since. Floyd Mayweather Jr., he's fought all 50 fights. They all take place in America. It, it's ridiculous. From 1996 to 2017, all fights in the USA. So you're telling us that Anoya Inoue is not a champion because he doesn't fight in America, and fans might not know much about him? I, I know who he is because I'm a Japanese fan. Why not? But at the same time, people want to see them fight, but the environment and getting used to it might be the fact of the problem. But yet again, it's like, yes, if Naoya Inoue does get a contract or someone from Saudi Arabia says, hey, you might, uh, we're going to give you a good amount of money if you can fight in Saudi Arabia to get the big crowd pleasing and something like that, blah, blah. But yet again, I don't think there's nothing much to say about that because... Like, <laughs> Guys, no, yeah, no way. We can do whatever he wants to. Like, what? What is your problem? That's just a problem. I, 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 I hate every bit of that. I, I just hate that. It's, it's ridiculous. You are not an undisputed champion. You are not the greatest fighter if you fight only in Japan. What kind of a statement is that? Like, I'm serious. There's no point of that. There's no point of that. Of a statement. Say what you want to about Noah in a way. He is a dangerous fighter. He's a dangerous man no matter what. He can do anything he wants to. Just because he's Japanese, he can fight in Japan at any time if he wants to. You don't have to push him. Yet again, anyone can fight anywhere if they want to. Guys, if someone wants the title shot, go to their country and fight them. Come on, South African uh, Kafu, he became a, a world champion this year. He won against Tanaka. They don't get anywhere. He fought in Japan and he won. Yes, he fought all his fights in Africa before the fights days ago, but still, that's that's actually still a cheers to say. Come on. So there's no point of arguing that statement that saying, oh, you are supposed to fight in America. You fight with us, but hey, if we're not going to fight there, we're not going to. But yet again, are you going to lose your undisputed titles if you don't fight there? Depending on who the promoter is going to win or who's going to agree what venue takes place? Well, yeah, you, you might. <clears throat> Does Noya in a way worry about that? Well, I don't know. Guys, we're all, we also heard reports that... um. We, we also heard a report that four hours ago on um, BoxingScene.com stated that fight between um, superstar Noya Inoue and um, Matering Junto Nakatani makes sense for 2025 because people believe that Noya Inoue should not go up to weight class because maybe they should think that Junto Nakatani should go up to him and fight. Now, now that would be a great fight, but guys, I don't think Junto Nakatani is ready for that big fight. And the reason I say that is simple because while looking up his record as of right now, his title wins has been pretty uh, not in the record of resume. Like I would call him a class B fighter of a B plus fighter. You could say he's an A minus fighter, but not a huge class A, but like, his win in his WBO World Flyweight title against a 24-1 guy in 2020 was a good fight. But then his title defenses were like, meh. 
to a 22 and two guy, and then a year later in 2022, he fights against eight and one fire from Japan, and well, he's already down the cusp a little bit, but yet again, can't say much about it. And then he steps up to weight class to 111 to 114. He defeats Francisco Rodriguez Jr. by non-title fight in 10 rounds, and that, that was a pretty that was a pretty good fight. Then he defeats J Andrew Maloney a year later in May of 2023 for WBO World Super Flyweight. He's now two division champion. He retained the belt against a somebody guy, 25, 3, and 2. Okay. And thinking to myself, he should fight for most of the world titles. He decided to step up an extra few more pounds to take on Alexander Santiago. A guy with 20 wins, 3 losses, and 5 draws for the WBC World Bantamweight belt. And I'm like, eh, eh, I don't know. I don't think he was ready. And technically the fight wasn't that much to talk about. But yet again, last July, going first round KO, that fight was nothing. People think Tasana Salapat was a really dangerous fighter. 76 wins, one loss. Oh, he's going to bring in the smoke. But when you look up his resume and realize, yeah, something's up. And Junto, like, I'm happy Junto showed him what a real boxer does. But, yet again, like, like yes, Junto is, like, 26 years old and, in a way, is over 30 years old. So, it depends. But, yet again, I wouldn't say that he's ready for that fight. But, yet again, it, it, it will be an interesting win for any one of the Japanese fighters. Because I think Japanese fighters fighting each other is a really dangerous feat that they know more dangerous stuff than anyone else that comes to America. So, I think it's going to be an interesting fight. Say what you want to because you can throw in anything you want to. And I think these fighters, they can do whatever they want to, but if you have what it takes to go out the aisle, to walk like you do, and talk like you do, and perform your best. You can throw anything out there, man. I throw out anything I say that this is a fight of a lifetime that we will may never see again. But yet again, is Junto Nakatani ready for this fight? Maybe... But Naoya, in a way, his resume and his title fights has been more reasonable than anyone else's because he's fought in dangerous situations. He, like, he took on a 43-1-2 guy against Omar Andres Narvaez, and he was a dangerous fighter, and he knocked him out in the second round by KO for the WBO Super Flyweight title that he was defending that day. That's a pretty good fight. It's ridiculous, man. It's ridiculous. But that's not all. That is not all because as he as he's fighting um everything he's doing when it, when when it comes to these people um pardon me, my head itches. But when it comes to him Throwing out all this stuff. He boxes his way, winning title after title. Considering he was at 115 pounds during his earlier days, even though when he was the WBC Worldwide Flyweight title and how he won in 2014 as well, but yeah, again, not much of tough competition, but oh man... Yet again, I think there's so much stuff here. So much stuff here. This is one of them. Like, Adrian Hernandez, that win in April of 2014, was like, oh, man. Like, it was a good fight, but was Noya ready for that fight? Even his way against Ryuichi Taguchi in, in August of 2018, his fourth fight was his first tough fight. But his other fights in 2015 and 2016 were fights, nonetheless. Like, he went up weight class in 2018, and he defeated guys like Jamie McDonald, Juan Carlos Payana in the super, in the tournament that, that year. And he even defeated Emmanuel Rodriguez, which was like, dang, yeah, he was more dangerous. 
Nonito Donaire gave him a tough fight that year in 2019. He defeats Jason Maloney, that was also in the tournament. And Michael Desmarinez, like, these were some great contenders at the time. He had a rematch with Donaire in 2022. Paul Butler, undisputed. Stefan Fulton, Marlon Tapales, great wins in 2023. Luis Dure, he comes back from a knockout, knocks him down, and wins. TJ Dahoney, well, he was undefeated in Japan until September the 3rd this year. Now he's not. Guys, Noya in the way's resume and competition is more dangerous, but yet again, does he think Junto Nakatani has what it takes? I think he does, and he has to be careful for what he's doing because there's more to it than meets the eye. These fighters have what it takes to go out there and uh, perform their hardest. Because anyone can fight whatever. But yet again, um, because yet again, I wouldn't really say much about the other story someone made yesterday go, um, like last night, like, like well, yesterday this morning um, on Boxing Scene, someone also made another article about why Naya Inoue should think twice about rising too high because um, because some people thought that maybe it's probably for the best to uh, um, some people think that um, that Naya Inoue has a lot left to give to the sport as two time undisputed champion and and even when you look up more of the resume you can tell that he's more than a guy that has more to give, but yet again, is it enough? Like I think, I think it doesn't matter. Like, like guys, keep this in mind. Like Naoya in a way has done a good amount. Like, keep this in mind. Like Naoya in a way in twenty twenty. In 2023, became a four weight division champion. Is there any point of him even going back and just becoming like a a a contemplate champion or a sextuple champion? Like at the end of the day, guys, being an eight division champion, like like friggin' uh, Manny Pacquiao. It's ridiculous. So I can look at this and maybe, uh, maybe, maybe not. But I think we have to keep an eye on it. We, we should. We should keep an eye on it as long as we think it's okay. But yet again, I really think we should take it easy. Because in a way has been boxing since 2012. He's done this for 12 years. I could see him doing this. I, I could see his competitiveness be around for another few more years until um, 2027. So I do see that by before his mid-30s, he might have a dangerous chance of doing great. I think by the end of 2027, something tells me is like, oh, in 2025, he'll have a couple more other fights, make it 30-0, and, and then he'll be 32-0, and, and then he'll be 34-0 uh, in two fights a year. And by 2027, I'll be like, okay. Now that he is the legend, do you think his career is going to keep it up? Yet again, he might not have a chance to hit the boundaries as much as high. Yet again, he might go up to, to a featherweight and probably have a good time there. But here's the problem. Stefan Fulton is at that weight class now. So, and he's actually number one as we speak, because uh, last September this year, the 14th, he took on a guy named Carlos Castro, 
and surprisingly he got knocked down in round five by that fight and t the two judges barely gave him a split decision 10 rounds in that fight jesus so i don't think he has what it takes anymore after his loss against in away jeez Whew. ow Yet again, if he does step up to featherweight, what other fighter is he going to take on against? Is it going to be Rafael Espinoza? Like, he's 25-0. and 0. He's the WBO World Featherweight Champion. He's a 30-year-old guy. So, yet again, if Luis Nere could knock him down, would he do the same thing? Uh, who knows? Maybe, maybe not. It's a chance. Or... Uh, or will he take on Angelo Leo, a guy that's the IBF World Featherweight Champion? He defeated Luis Alberto Lopez um, uh, last August, two months ago. Knocked him down in round 10 to win the IBF title, considering two judges had 86 to 85 in favor of him. The other had it the same way to Lopez. So, yeah, again, and it was a close fight for what it was until the 10th round. So, you could say there's a chance... But yet again, I think the thing is, guys, I think we have to learn the strategy of learning to be careful when we fight against Inoue. But guys, speaking about Japanese fighters, we have a guy named Mikito Nakano, 11-0, 10 knockouts. He's rated number 10 in the featherweight as a Japanese fighter, and his resume has started out random. Like his third professional fight, he took on a guy with 12 wins and 2 losses, but I couldn't say much about that. But yet again... He took on 11 3 and 1 fighter, 16 and 7 in last August. And then in this month of May, he defeated a guy named Sathaporn Saat, a 13 and 1 fighter, and won. He won the, the Oriental Pacific uh, Boxing Federation featherweight title um, this September last month ago in a round 4 KO fight. Um, pretty much. Uh, there's another guy that I'm a little bit more interested in, named, and his name is uh, Keisuke Matsumoto, ranked number 11 in that division as well, one uh, shorter than the other guy. And his 12-0 record, I wouldn't say it's like a Mark Gastineau record, but considering after his uh, first fights in his first professional year, like his win against Ryoto Ishida was like an uh, interesting fight. This guy was a tough dude. He had some interesting... Um, boxing skills, but I wouldn't say he had much to um, prove about it, but yet again. Um, there was uh, another fight against uh, Ryo Sagawa for the Japan Boxing Commission Japanese featherweight title. They won last April last year ago. He won another title that August, and and that went decision. Like it, it, What's actually crazy about his career, 12 wins, 8 knockouts, and his last four yeah, technically, his first seven fights were were knockouts. And four fights later, later from 8, 9, 10, and 11 were all decisions. Yeah. And then his last fight in October the 17th, which was two days ago, he goes second round KO. Sheesh. So technically, there are some Japanese boxers that are in the division right now throwing everything they got. And maybe, in a way, might handle some of that. So... We might not know. We might not know. It could be possible. It just could be possible. Anyway. <clears throat> so, guys, I wait. Guys, this is going to be a while for me to talk about. But yet again, I might as well talk about it now. We already talked about Oscar Colazzo and uh, Thamanun Niamtrong for the... Uh, unified minimum weight titles against those guys that would take place in Saudi Arabia on November the 16th. But on November the 15th, live in ATN Stadium in Arlington, the undisputed super lightweight title, Katie Taylor, a woman that lost her first professional fight against Chantel Cameron, and she won the fight uh, last November, last year ago, in a rematch, there were reports of how she defeated Amanda Serrano in uh, April of 2022. She retained the belt that same year and then lost and won it back. Uh, Serrano, guys, she's a seven-time 
seven weight class champion. And at this moment, I'm thinking to myself, maybe she should just not. But guys, she's 36 years old. She's fought for now 15 years since 2009, 2014. And think of yourself, 47 wins, 31 knockouts, two losses, one draw. Yet again, she's she proved herself as a real dangerous killer, as a Puerto Rican fighter. The real deal. 36 years old. She's in she's in her mid 30s, past her prime, but she's achieved enough success already. Yet again, guys, if I was her, I would just go up another weight class. Because she's won a good amount of titles as she's done recently. Like she's done a good job for what she's done already undisputed and she's destroyed enough so even if she does win against katie taylor this november which i don't see that yet again i would say she still has what it takes because at this moment she wins she wins she doesn't she doesn't guys if i was her i would almost just step up to the welterweight division like, at this moment, you think to yourself, does she have what it takes to be in the welterweight? And I do think to myself, Amanda Serrano has nothing to gain anymore except just making history. Like, Amanda Serrano might prove herself as a real competitor in the sport. She's earned that amazement. Like, she holds the Guinness World Record for the most world champions won in different weight classes as a female. Having held nine major world titles across seven different weight classes. She's won, like in 2011, she's the felt featherweight champion. 2014, she's the lightweight champion. Uh, she won the featherweight in 2016, the super bantamweight months and months and months later. She was the bantamweight in April of 2017. Light welterweight in 2018. <laughs> and then in 2019, she was a super flyweight champion which i saw that fight and it ended in the first round Psh, nothing do it <laughs> and just to let you viewers know the light welterweight is also the super lightweight which is the division that well that's where amanda and katie taylor are doing and they're actually fighting for that belt so she's not a welterweight champion yet again guys the weight class i i think amanda serrano as considered she is a a really um fit girl i could say that she might have a good chance of being 140 pounds at that weight she can go welterweight i think yet again does she really want to go there i would almost say try like amanda serrano's heaviest in her entire career is weighing 136 pounds last july in a win she took on with so uh, I wouldn't really say it's much to talk about there. She was 138 pounds in 2018 when she won the super lightweight belt, the WBO, which has now been won by Katie Taylor because she holds all the belts. So if she can hold on to part of her weight, I, I think she can handle herself pretty good. Like she was, like she can, I think she can handle a little bit. I could say that she has another good amount of stuff in her i think she can handle a loss with over 50 professional fights in her resume and i can see her winning even 50 fights or so i like even if she does what welterweight fight do you want to think about see because i think the most i could see is her probably taking on a 40 year old natasha jones jonas because her seven years in boxing have been having problems like she's 15 two and one draw um, it's ridiculous because her first six professional fights haven't been that interesting since 2017 and 2018, but it's common to have that in your first years with pro taking on nobodies. The problem is her next fight after that in August, she lost her first fight against a 12 and four fighter. It's ridiculous. And she continued taking on some nobodies, but then she, then in 2020, she took on a big contender of Kerry Harper and then the draw lost against Katie Taylor in 2021 and for the unified of lightweight titles then she won the super welterweight title at 149 pounds in 2022 um she fought she won another piece of title in september she won against samaria eva dakar in november and then she went down a few extra pounds to go under 148 pounds to be in the welterweight and she won 
as she defeated Katie Michaela Mayer by a controversial fight of a fight because it made uh, Michaela Mayer the biggest a uh, biggest bust in boxing in my opinion. So who knows? But yeah, again, what about anyone else that would involve a good sh fight? Like I, I can say that someone could put in a good. Uh, a good title fight against anyone, but yet again, you can say, like, even though Lauren Price is an IBO champion, but yet again, as a champion in the welterweight division, I wouldn't say there was a lot of great competition for for sir, for Amanda to fight against, but I could say that she might have a chance to do what she did in 2019 and broke seven weight classes. I think she could go 140 and a quarter pounds. As long as you're at that weight, you're in the welterweight. So I would just say to myself, if she doesn't win this fight against Kay Taylor, maybe it's probably for the best to just go up a weight class. And if it doesn't work, then it was a fail. But hey, you tried. I, I think we want to see a record being held right now. She hasn't been in the weight class win since 2019. So maybe... At her later age of her stage, she might as well go for something interesting. Thing is, like, Manny Pacquiao started winning multiple weight classes during the end of the 2000 decade, winning it after back to back to back to back from 2000 to 2009. He was winning it multiple weight classes just like that. But the thing was, he stopped. <coughs> he stopped quickly. What do you mean? 1998, he was flyweight champion. 2001, super bantamweight. Um, and then in 2003, he made a name for himself in 2003 for the featherweight win. Uh, 2008, he's super featherweight. It took him five years to get a fourth weight class. And guess what? That was the month of March. June 2008, he defeats David Diaz for the lightweight. Light welterweight against Ricky Hatton in May 2009. Then he becomes welterweight for the WBO in 2009 of November. And then in November the 13th, a year later, he defeats Antonio Margarito, the cheater, for the light middleweight title. Dude. 98 to 2001, 2002, 3, he was three weight classes. From March the 15th, 2008 to November the 2010, he, those two and a half years, he won five straight weight classes. He broke... Dude, he surpassed. He surpassed. Like, like, dude, he surpassed Oscar De La Hoya's record of six weight class champions. And he even went over that mark. But of course, by the end of 2010, it seemed like he was going to stay in the welterweight. And yes, he stayed in the welterweight for the rest of his career in the 2010s and thought it was it. I think Amanda Serrano might have what it takes to go for something. Like, she's already broken history. Like, like look here. After she was a six-time champion, only her was the only one that managed to become a six-weight class champion. When you look at how many females became a five-time champion, it was Naoko Fujiwaka. Since in 2017, December, she became a light flyweight champion. That was her fourth champion. Uh, Clarissa Shields, she did in July 2024, winning the light heavyweight and the heavyweight title in two. She won in five. Amanda Serrano did the first time in April 22nd, 2017, months before Naoka Fujiwaka Oka actually did that. And then, yeah, Amanda Serrano didn't stop. In September of 2018, she just went on and she continued winning another one a year later. So I would say Amanda Serrano should go big for next year. Even if she doesn't defeat Katie Taylor, I think it's going to be an interesting um, thing to watch because this could be the moment where we see history. And that right there... Is all I have to say. So thank you for watching this podcast, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you viewers enjoy the video. But guys, before we go, um, guys, I did say that I would almost review UFC 4 in 1994. And to be honest, guys, 
am I going to keep on reviewing more UFC videos? Well, to be honest, guys, I will probably do them in 2025 to hit the buzzard. But if people, if I do make it to 100 episodes of the Mr. Glow podcast, but you people don't watch my content, I might as well just quit this whole series I made because at the other day, you people aren't watching my content. There's just too much problems and you people just treat me like I'm a stepchild, a poor dang stepchild. So it's so bad that people do not give me credit or even help me. And I go outside in the public sacrificing my body every day and I almost get killed a bunch of times. It's crazy. So anyway, guys, we'll just have to wait and see after I get to maybe 100 episodes. Who knows? So, um, But anyway, if you people do enjoy this episode, thank you for watching the Mr. Glow podcast. I hope you viewers enjoy. With all that being said, thank you very much for watching this. And with that being said, my name's The Fox Wolf, and I am signing off right now. See ya.